okay, we've got a triangle wave. That's one of the basic sounds that every VCO needs to make. But what I want is a sine wave. After all, Monsieur Fourier has told us that with sine waves we can make any signal we like. How am I going to do that? Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. One key thing that practically every synthesizer VCO needs to have is sine wave outputs, along with the other basics, ramp, triangle, square, and pulse. Sine waves are the hardest of the lot to generate cleanly. We've already seen circuits for the others. The usual method is to find some way to roll off the points of a triangle wave to come up with an approximation to a sine. The circuit that does that is usually called, unimaginatively, a triangle to sine converter, although the synthesizer people appear to prefer sine shaper. While I was reviewing the material that I wanted to cover on integrators and differentiators over in the OPAV series, I stumbled on a diagram for one shaper in Learning the Art of Electronics, which is a terrific lab manual for studying electronics, by the way. It was presented in passing as part of a side comment to a different discussion and had just a hand sketched schematic. There wasn't any supporting text about what its input or output voltages should be, what specs it needed on the pair of 2.4 volt reference supplies that it used, or any of the rest of the practical details. I think the authors wanted students to figure it out for themselves. I'd seen shapers like this before, but I'd never built one. I thought that working through the circuit analysis and putting one together would make a quick, fun video for the channel. And I fell down a rabbit hole. Before we continue, let me interrupt for a few moments. My videos are always free to all comers. Nothing is ever paywalled, and I don't waste your time selling various dodgy products. But I do end every video with a plea that you take care of one another. To this end, all the channel's ad revenue has gone to charity. This month's featured recipient is Made Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. MSF is an independent international organization that offers medical humanitarian aid to people based solely on need, without regard to race, religion, gender, or political affiliation. It provides over 10 million consultations annually in more than 70 countries, including some of the regions most torn by violence, neglect, or catastrophe. And it trains health workers and invests in local infrastructure to meet healthcare needs sustainably in a community-driven way. I'm asking my viewers to join me in supporting this organization. This is a small channel, so I've set a modest goal of $500. Those $500 could provide two treatments to cure patients of hepatitis C, four resuscitators for non-invasive ventilation in newborns, or enough vaccine to immunize nearly 1,400 children against measles during a deadly outbreak. We managed to meet our goal in the last fundraiser, so I'm sure that my wonderful viewers can get us there again. Won't you please join me today? Thank you so very much. There's a ton of electronic history buried in these things, going all the way back to the 1950s. Ms. AI, could you take me back in time, please? Sure. One moment. I need to reticulate the splines. The year was 1939. A couple of engineers named Bill Hewlett and David Packard had just finished graduate degrees at Stanford and were doing electronics hacking out of Packard's garage. After some experimentation, their big break came. They produced a high-precision audio oscillator, the HP-200A. Eight of them went to Walt Disney Studios to test the sound equipment used in producing the movie Fantasia, known at the time for its elaborate orchestral performance. Hewlett and Packard had made a name for themselves in test equipment. Of course, the Second World War intervened. The U.S. military needed electronic equipment. Lots of it. 
By the end of the war, HP had grown to over 200 people and produced not only the audio oscillator, but a distortion analyzer, a wave analyzer, and a vacuum tube voltmeter. Hewlett and Packard worked on early electronic countermeasures and on proximity fuses for bombs. The company received the Army Navy E Award for Excellence in Production, which was given only to about 5% of the contractors who performed war work. In 1947, with Hewlett back from serving in the Signal Corps, the company was finally able to incorporate. Fast forward to 1951. HP came to realize that their product line would be improved by a precision low-frequency oscillator. The Veenbridge oscillator that the 200A used was not going to hack it, and HP started investigating LFO designs. What they came up with was the 202A function generator, which uses an idea that's still in wide use today. It's easy to build a triangle wave oscillator, and square waves come along for the ride. We saw that in the last episode on this series. What HP found was a way to round over the triangles to make nearly perfect sine waves. Less than 1% RMS distortion. The circuit used an array of diodes with resistors connecting them to a voltage divider. Yes, vacuum tube diodes. Six dual diodes in all. But by the mid-1950s, HP realized that they could cut costs by using these newfangled silicon junction diodes that had been developed for radar during the war, but were now coming onto the civilian market, and modified the circuit to look like this. What we're interested in is this part, the sign shaper, that converts the triangle waves to sine waves. The manual for the unit contains a more detailed schematic. Look at those supply voltages. 225 and 75 volts. The cathode follower that buffers the output has 375 volts on the plate and a grid bias of 162 volts. I think we might possibly need to scale some component values if we're going to demonstrate this thing with modern semiconductor devices. But before we jump into scaling components, how does this diode ladder thingy actually work? We'll start with the simplest possible sign shaper. Nothing. Well, you have to start somewhere, right? Besides, a triangle wave is sort of kind of an approximation to a sign, isn't it? I didn't say it was a good sign shaper. Okay, let's make a better one. What's the simplest thing that could possibly improve things? Well, we're starting with a triangle wave. It climbs at a constant rate and descends at a constant rate. Because of symmetry, we can limit ourselves to looking at only a quarter of a cycle. What we want is a sine wave. One obvious thing to do is to wire in a diode to some reference voltage. When the triangle wave goes more than a diode drop above that voltage, the diode will conduct and limit the output voltage. That will cut the peak off the triangle wave, making it more like a sine wave. Obviously, we need a diode to a negative reference voltage as well, to do the same thing with the negative peak. Before we go on, let's quickly determine what we want input and output voltages to be. The general form for a sine wave is f of x equals a times the sine of x over b, for some constants a and b. And we know a few things that will let us determine what a and b are. First, when neither diode is conducting, the output voltage equals the input voltage. So the slope of the curve at the origin has to be 1. We'll take our function, differentiate it to give it the slope, and set the slope to 0 at the origin. That tells us that a has to be equal to b. The maximum value of the sine function is plus and minus 1. So our maximum output voltage is a. That maximum is reached when the argument to the sine is pi over 2, or the input voltage is a times pi over 2. If I choose 3 volts for the peak output voltage, the peak input voltage will have to be 3 halves pi volts, or about 4.712 volts. That's a convenient value. Usually in a synthesizer, we use waveforms of plus or minus 5 volts, and having the input voltage be a little lower than that will let us fine-tune it with a trimmer to adjust for component variation. We'll go with that. With the small amount of current, the 3 volts will trickle through a 33K resistor. 
a diode drop will be only about 400 millivolts rather than the 600 we usually calculate with. So for a 3 volt output, our reference voltages will have to be plus and minus 2.6 volts. Let's hit the simulation and see if the world's second worst sign shaper does what we say. It certainly appears to. The output wave is flat topping at about 3 volts. We can see in the lower trace a comparison with the input triangle and how we're clipping the peak to nearly a straight line. The corners are rounded off a little from the exponential current voltage curve of the diode. The round-off works in our favor, though, because the sine function is smooth without sharp corners. Using an active clamp like the one we recently saw in the op-amp series would be a bad idea. How can we improve this further? The idea behind the diode ladder is that we clip off the corner again. We choose a point somewhere on the sine function. I'll choose the center of the interval that we have so far, where the input and output voltage would be as shown. We know the slope at that point, so we can draw the tangent line through it. We can compute the points of intersection with the neighboring lines that are already there, and we can shave off the corners. The key numbers that we take away from this are the output voltages where the slopes change and the slopes of the tangent lines. Next, we take a voltage in the middle of the row of the table, subtract one diode drop, and design a voltage divider to get that voltage by dividing down the reference voltage. Of course, we need the same divider on the negative side. Oh, and we want to make sure the resistance looking into the divider is much less than the input resistor. I've used a factor of over 100 here. Then we need to add a diode pair going to that voltage divider. Next, we have to design a second voltage divider. The effective upper resistor of that divider will be the resistance looking back toward the input voltage. Here it's just the 33K resistor, but there's a case coming where it's different. The division ratio needs to be the ratio between the current slope and the next previous one. That's enough information to determine the lower resistor value. It's an oddball value of 79.6K. I've got a whole collection of 1% resistors in 5% values. A 75K plus a 4.7K will be close enough. Precision matters here, so the nearest 5% value is probably not good enough. And now we have something that we can try simulating again. Yeah, it's definitely somewhat more sign-like. If you squint just right, you can see a little bit of a corner at an output voltage of around a volt and a half, where the slope abruptly decreases. It's easier to see in the bottom trace, where the one-stage and two-stage circuits are compared. It's also showing a pattern that we're going to see in all of these circuits, where the diodes operate in waves. They turn on from the right to the left and turn off again from the left to the right. This is still a pretty poor flat-topped sign. Can we make it better? We don't even need to add a third stage yet. It turns out that the midpoint of the interval was a poor choice for the tangent point that we drew. There's almost no error to the left of it, and quite a lot to the right. If we slide the point a little bit to the right, into the region where the error is high, we can get a better approximation. The rest of the calculation works the same way, making a table of slopes and designing the dividers. I'm going to skip over it and go straight to the simulation. That's a much better sign. It's rounder at the top. This time you don't even need to squint to see the corners. But at least they're better placed so that the curve looks more like a sine wave. This is about as good as we're going to get with two stages. Shall we try three? We go through the same procedure as before, only now we choose two intermediate points on the sine wave. We draw the tangent lines to the sine curve at those points, compute the points of intersection, and tabulate the output voltages where the slopes change and the slopes of the segments. We design voltage dividers to produce voltages a diode drop below the ones in this column. 
This resistor forms a voltage divider with the input resistor. The divider ratio needs to be 0 0.707, the ratio of the slopes before and after the breakover voltage. We calculate its value the same way we did last time, and round it to the nearest standard 1% value. I'm not going to mess with pairs of 5% values. Now we come to a case that we haven't seen before. When either of these two diodes starts conducting, the source impedance it sees isn't just the input resistor, because the diode to its right is already conducting. Instead, it sees the input resistor in parallel with the resistor from the other stage, or in this case, 23.5 kiloohms. The divider ratio is still the ratio of the current slope to the previous one. Here, it's 0.296. Working through the divider formula, we get a value of 9.88k for the resistor. The nearest standard 1% value is a convenient 10k. Of course, we still need the last pair of diodes to clamp the output at 3 volts. How does this one look in the circuit simulator? That's a pretty good looking sine curve. I can see hints maybe at the abrupt slope changes here and here, but they're really hard to pick out. This might be pretty workable. But HP didn't stop here. They went all the way to six pairs of diodes. This is the best six diode replica I've been able to come up with using our input and output voltages. The output surely looks like a sine wave. And now I can't see the slope changes at all. Time to build it, right? Well, not so fast. This design calls for 12 distinct precision resistor values. And only two of them are ones I usually have on hand. I'd have to order the other 10. But also, what I came up with doesn't look at all like the sketch the textbook showed, and I'd like to have a closer look at that one. What's different in the book's version is that the input resistor is much, much smaller and so are the resistors that connect the output to the diode pairs. That means that the current the diode pairs push into the divider stack will no longer be negligible, and the voltages on the divider nodes will vary with the input voltage. The divider voltages are also set at irregular intervals. I don't quite know what's going on with that either, except that I suspect that it's being done because this circuit uses only 5% resistor values. I suspect it's designed for people like me who keep 1% resistors and 5% values. In the simulator, it produces a beautiful looking sine wave, but I want to study it some more before I build it. But I need to break for now. So this is where I'll pick up next time. Until then, Stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!